so about um, the contents yeah um, here we have the table of contents and um, I have to say that this lecture includes all the chapters except number two to five which is the logic part so there will be no logic in this lecture I mean there is a simple reason why we have no logic here because the logic is included in the lecture uh, theoretical computer science which will be given next semester this is an uh, compulsory course for the master computer science but not for the other masters yeah? but of course it is optional for the other masters yeah? um, um, so this is one reason second reason is that this whole contents would be too much for a four hour lecture yeah? uh, so we split it up and put the logic into the theoretical computer science and here there will be no logic but I mean, um, you don't actually need the logic for all the other chapters, number one uh, and six through ten. Uh, so there will be no problem without uh, deeper knowledge of logic. Of course, you need to know a little bit of propositional logic, but that's all you need to know. Uh, um, and it turns out that in modern AI, I would say between 80 and 90 percent of all applications of AI are without uh, first order logic. Yeah? I mean, first order logic is getting um, a little bit more interesting again in the areas of semantic web and in robotics too. I mean, high-level planning for robots involves uh, deep knowledge of first-order logic. But most of the other fields in AI, they don't need any predicate logic. So you will actually learn about the modern areas of AI without knowing the logic. And if you're really interested in logic, come to the theoretical computer science lecture uh, next semester. It will be about one-third of the semester. Actually, the first third of the semester will be the logic part. Okay, so we will now start with the introduction and then continue with uh, searching, then reasoning with uncertainty, which is very important nowadays in AI, because in everyday reasoning, um, you almost never have full knowledge of the state of the world and also um, your knowledge is not uh, certain. Um, then uh, very important is machine learning and data mining. Actually uh, machine learning is the core of AI. Many people say that a system is not intelligent unless it is able to learn. Then um, neural networks I made a separate chapter because it is a big area, but it, of course, is part of machine learning. Yeah? And also reinforcement learning is part of machine learning, but it's, it's an, an its own area uh, in AI nowadays, and therefore we have these separate chapters 9 and 10. Okay, so let's start. Oh, yeah, I mean, this is the bibliography. Uh, we don't go into detail now. Um, but let me say one thing about books. And this is pretty short. Apart from this book, there is the AI Bible. Huh? Uh, this is the book from Russell and Norvig, Artificial Intelligence. But, I mean, if you look at this book, uh, which is a thickness of about one centimeter, then the Russell Norvig book is like that, more or less 10 centimeters. I mean, this book has around 300 pages. Russell Norvig, 
I don't know, something between 1,200 and 1,500 pages. Huh? So it's between four, and five, four or five times as much volume as this book. And that's actually the reason why I wrote this book, because students complained. I mean, no student is able to read 1,500 pages. I mean, you could read it, but the question is, can a student understand uh, these 1,500 pages apart from uh, taking very much time? And so I finally decided uh, to write this AI book. Huh? Um, first, I wrote the German book, and then the German book turned out to sell very well. And so Springer, um, I mean, they look around uh, which books sell uh, very well, and then they ask me whether I would be interested in translating the book. And so you have the English book now. Okay, what is artificial intelligence? So what is intelligence or is the first question. If we want to talk about AI, of course we need to know what is intelligence. So we will talk about what is intelligence a little bit. Um, how can intelligence be measured? This will also be covered a little bit. How does our brain work? This is a pretty interesting question. I mean, we could call AI as a subfield of this new area called bionics. Huh? I mean, in bionics, researchers try to copy nature. For example, airplanes are a, a not excellent copy of, what, uh, of how birds fly, and uh, artificial intelligence can be seen as trying to copy how our brain works. But there is a problem. Um, the problem is that nobody knows how our brain works yet. Huh? Of course, there are these neurophysiologists, and they try to understand our brain. Uh, but I, I mean, I read books about neurophysiology. I also talked to Manfred Spitzer, who is a well-known person in neurophysiology, a professor from University Ulm. Um, and I, I asked him, tell me how uh, reinforcement learning in our brain works, which is very important. And then he said, oh, uh, let me think. Oh, yes, I've heard there is a book, uh, but I don't remember the title. Um, and then I said, you mean the book of Sutton and Barto called Reinforcement? Oh, yes, that's the book. Yeah. And then I knew everything, because this Sutton Barto book is a book written by two computer scientists who do not know what's going up in our brain but they know about mathematics and AI, uh, and they invented algorithms that uh, make computers able to do reinforcement learning. So uh, he was citing the book from my community, but he doesn't know how it works. Huh? I mean, they know a lot about our brain. They know uh, about chemistry. There is dopamine and other neurotransmitters, and they know if, for example, you drink alcohol, then alcohol blocks these neurotransmitters and your brain doesn't work anymore. Huh? Um, okay, so they know how the brain does not work, huh? but the interesting thing would be to know how the brain works if there is no alcohol or any other drugs. Um, they know that there are roughly 10, 10 billion uh, nerve cells in the brain. They also know that every nerve cell is connected on average to something between 1,000 and 10,000 other nerve cells. So that means how many, how many cables are there in our brain? Uh, so 10 billion times 10,000. So this makes 10 to the power 14, roughly, cables up there. And uh, I mean, 10 to the power 14 is a pretty big number. Huh? So if the probability, I, I mean, in, in real machines or computers with so many cables, the probability that one cable, one contact fails, I don't remember, per hour or per day, is one over a million. So that would mean out of these 10 to the power 14 cables, 
um, 10 to the power 8, which is 100 million failures would be per hour, per hour or per day. Yeah? Uh, but we don't have that, that many failures. Actually, we do have failures all the time, but um, our brain is fault tolerant, which is, uh, of course, an excellent property. Um, but that's about all we know about our brain. Of course, they know, okay, there is this area, uh, which is the visual cortex, and there is the olfactory cortex, which is about hearing, and then there is uh, the memory and their language. They know these sections of the brain, but each one of these sections has uh, billions of nerve cells, and they don't know the details. They don't know the wiring between the nerve cells. Huh? And if they don't, uh, can't give us the, the, the plan of, of the brain, how can we copy it? We can't. Um, but of course it is fascinating. We all the time, we AI researchers, look at how we humans act, how we learn and so on, and try to copy it. But this is just from a behavioral view. We don't know about the details. Okay, so we are uh, actually involved in building intelligent machines from scratch, more or less, and using, of course, mathematics. Then, of course, there is this science fiction uh, matter. Uh, you know about these movies uh, like uh, iRobot and so on. Um, rebuild the human mind, we already talked about this. And there is uh, a track going into philosophy. Um, for example, I mean, when I show my robots to uh, people, many of them ask, oh, this is interesting, this, this robot learns. Does this robot uh, have consciousness? So it must have consciousness. So then there, there are these questions. Can a machine ever have a consciousness? Does this machine uh, have a consciousness or not? Um, pretty interesting questions. Um, yeah. So now let's talk about uh, what is intelligence. Um, I will now give you a number of different definitions. So John McCarthy in 1955, this was actually the birthday of AI. Yeah? It was in 55 or 56 uh, in, of course, the United States. And John McCarthy was one of the leading scientists uh, who helped uh, AI getting into this world. Uh, there was also uh, um, Marvin Minsky, and some other researchers. We will see their names on the next slides. And his definition uh, of AI was, the aim of AI is to develop machines that behave as if they were intelligent. Yeah. But of course, uh, what's the problem with this definition? There are many problems with this definition. But there is one obvious problem. I mean, unless we don't define intelligence, this doesn't help at all. Huh? So we need a definition of intelligence. Huh? Um, now, let me show you a movie. Oh, we can actually uh, move a little bit forward.
Okay. So you might consider this little robot intelligent. Huh? Maybe some of you would say it is intelligent, others would say it is not intelligent. At least it was able to solve the task. That means remo remove all the Coca-Cola cans from this area with the black uh, stripe around it and keep all the, what was the other, Pepsi uh, cans in it. Huh? Um, but now let me tell you how this robot works. This robot on the front has just a little touch sensor. And that's, and, and that's everything. Huh? Um, and so what the robot does, and it has on the bottom a little sensor that tells him whether it uh, moved across the black stripe on the ground. Huh? So the robot just randomly moves around and when it uh, crosses the black line then it moves back again inside. And it does another random movement and then there is this little touch sensor. Huh? If this sensor um, gives a signal to the robot then the, ro the robot stops and goes back. Does another random movement so it wouldn't push the can out if there is this signal. And so the only thing is the Coca-Cola cans, they were full, uh, no, uh, no, the other way around. They were empty and the Pepsi cans, they were full. So the, the touch sensor only gives the signal if there is uh, enough pressure here. Huh? So it's extremely simple. It's extremely simple logic. Huh? Um, so w would you now still consider this robot intelligent? So the, uh, the simple message is not everything that looks as if it were intelligent is really intelligent. Huh? So we need maybe a somewhat deeper uh, understanding of intelligence. Maybe that's what we need. But maybe we will not be able to define this term intelligent precisely enough. Uh -huh. um, so the video we saw was actually pretty similar to what uh, Professor Breitenberg, he used to be, and I, I guess he is now a re uh, retired, he used to be a professor in Tübingen at the Max Planck Institute um, and he had this little experiment, he built very simple little robots like this or that, pretty similar to what we saw in the video. This is a robot with a light sensor here and a light sensor there and this light sensor is directly connected to the motor for this left wheel and the right sensor for the right wheel. And that means the more light we have here, the faster this wheel turns. And the same with the other one. So that means um, if the robot is like this and this is a light source, then there is a little bit more light on the left side and the robot will make a right turn. So as a consequence, the robot will move away from the light. If you just uh, switch these two sensors, then the behavior will, will be such that the robot moves towards the light. And I mean, still this is extremely simple logic inside these robots. And now what Breitenberg did, he took a big room like that, empty, and then he put into the room a couple of these robots, maybe 20 of them. And for example, a light bulb in the middle of the room and nothing else, the rest is dark. So now what happens, if you, if you take these guys, they'll all move away from the light and finally they will crash into the walls of the room. So they will be all around the walls of the room. These guys 
they'll all move towards the light and hit into the light. Yeah? Okay, this is not really interesting. But now, the next step was, suppose we have all robots of this kind. And then he put on the back side, on the robot, a little lamp. Huh? Or maybe somewhere on top of the robot. He put a little lamp. And then we have these 20 robots in the room. Now what would then be the behavior? How would the room look like after a certain time? Hmm? Some of them can avoid from each other. They what? They can avoid from each other. They avoid each other, yes, but how would the behavior in the room look like? And also you could imagine these guys with the light on them. How would the room look like here? I mean, actually what Breitenberg did was the other way around. He just put these robots in the room, let them move around, and then he had spectators, people watching these robots. And the people said, oh, look, this is intelligent behavior. That's what people said. Because what they saw with these guys is, this is like, uh, it looked like the hall of a train station with many people walking around or waiting for something. Uh, what happens? These, these robots, they will try to avoid each other. That means they will more or less distribute evenly around the room. Huh? And this looks like intelligent behavior. That's what people said. Huh? How about these guys? I mean, of course, there, there will be some crashes, robots really crashing into each other, which people interpreted as aggressive behavior. Huh? Um, but also, there will be some leaders and others following these leaders. Like in a queue, they, they just uh, move around and, and uh, I mean, as soon as one robot is behind this guy, it will always follow this robot. Huh? Um, and of course it's even more interesting if you mix these and these guys in one room and maybe you have some light sources in the room or maybe around the border of the room everything is, uh, is enlightened so uh, they won't crash into the border anymore and so you, you can produce behavior that looks really sophisticated with these extremely simple agents. I mean, you know it from nature too. If you look at an ant colony, uh, the behavior looks pretty intelligent, even though each individual ant is extremely simple. Uh, but there is this collective uh, intelligence, finally. Okay, another definition from... Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica. AI is the ability of a digital computer or computer-controlled robot to perform tasks commonly associated with intelligent beings. Yeah, I mean, this is similar to McCarthy's definition, but a little bit more detailed. Yeah? Commonly associated with intelligent beings. But according to this definition, every computer is an AI system because doing sophisticated mathematical calculations is commonly associated with intelligent beings. Playing chess also. And actually, you know, uh, computers play chess very well, I guess better than everybody in this room, even a simple, the simplest PC. Uh, uh, chess software. So e we might even conclude that these computers are more intelligent than we are. Huh? 
Um, so this is not perfect either. And now I give you my favorite definition of AI. This is from Elaine Rich, an AI professor from uh, the United States. And she says, artificial intelligence is the study of how to make computers do things at which at the moment people are better. I mean, this is kind of funny because it is not a fixed definition. It is a moving target. This definition changes from year to year. But this is actually uh, what AI is all about. If we go 30 years back, around 1980, um, in journals about AI and on conferences, you could read and hear people writing and talking about chess computers about new inventions in chess computers. This was really a topic in AI research. Today, there is no, no chess anymore in AI publications. Maybe one out of 10,000, something like that. One publication every year, or I don't know. But it, it vanished. And why? Because it's no longer interesting. We solved the problem. So it's no longer AI. It is. Maybe it's computer science, whatever. But it's, it's no more AI. Um, what is the, the current fashion in AI? I mean, of course, one part is making the web more intelligent. Uh, semantic web, this direction. But the, the main thread is autonomous agents, robots. Uh, making robots intelligent. Because we do have the feeling that it is possible in the next 10 to 20 years to make robots really intelligent. But it is a real challenge. It's a real challenge. And the challenge is, of course, to solve these problems that we have not solved yet. So the challenge is not doing linear algebra on the computer. Huh? The challenge is these simple tasks like if I ask you, please leave the room, then you have to get up, find the door, open the door and leave the room. This still is a real challenge for robots. For us it is trivial. Nobody would consider this as being intelligent leaving a room. But for the robots, this is a real challenge. Huh? So this is the type of problems we work now in AI. And you see, this is perfectly covered by this definition. It is a pragmatic definition, and not all AI researchers like it, but this definition is what AI is all about. And this definition will still be up to date in the year 2050. I mean, this, this definition will actually always be true. Maybe this field of AI will end at some point. Uh, maybe it will end at the point when robots are more intelligent than we are in every, uh, uh, in every sense, uh, then maybe we won't do any research in AI anymore. Then maybe we will do research on uh, how we can survive with all these robots around us. Um, yeah. Okay, brain research and problem solving. Um, yeah, we we already talked about this. Yeah, let me let me show you this picture. This is the AI pharmacy, um, and this is more or less my view of AI. Oh, I don't know the English term. In Germany, I would say AI is a Gemischtwarenladen. Huh? So it's a, it's a supermarket where you can buy everything. Huh? But the question is, the trader in this store or uh, in the pharmacy, if the customer comes and tells, okay, I have this disease, then of course the person behind the counter must be able to understand 
what kind of drug is good for this disease or for that disease. Huh? And since AI is a pragmatic science, an applied science, and we try to solve many different problems, starting from computer vision, ending in higher order logics, then of course this person behind the counter has to know about all the different diseases and about all the drugs for these diseases. So this means for AI there is no, not this one uh, technique from mathematics maybe which you perfectly have to know and you can solve all the problems. No, it's different. I mean there are many disciplines for example, control theory. In classical control theory, you have to know the theory of differential equations and how to solve them and how to model a system and everything is perfect and you can solve all classical control problems. Or in cryptography, you, know, uh, you need to know number theory and then you are a good uh, cryptologist. Huh? But here it is different. In AI, you have to know everything. Huh? Uh, that's the bad news, but it's, it's like it is. You need fields like logic. Yeah? And there are so many subfields in logic, meanwhile, so it, uh, logic is its own discipline. There is, of course, learning, machine learning. Yeah? And there are so many different techniques in machine learning. There is this field of neural networks, search theory, reasoning with uncertainty, many different application areas and so on. So this is, uh, yeah. So if you have a good basic knowledge of computer science and mathematics, um, then you have good preconditions for studying AI. But I mean it's very important that uh, you know about many different of these areas. Um, classically, let's say yeah, 30 years ago, there was this logic fraction among the AI people and this was very big at that time. Because at that time until the 80s, um, the logic people believed that with logic we can solve all problems on this globe. Uh, that was the belief uh, of the logic community, but it turned out they cannot solve all problems. It turned out that they can solve only very few problems. And uh, we need other techniques coming from statistics, for example, which now is, I would say, the dominant uh, mathematics used in AI. Strong statistics. Uh, which is not trivial at all. Uh, and I mean, a classical logician has no idea of statistic. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the problem. So, so the guys from this field and from that field, they haven't even been able to talk to each other. But things are changing now and uh, you need these different fields uh, in order to understand AI. Okay. Let's continue with the definition of AI and the definition of how we can measure intelligence. And again, Alan Turing was a pioneer in AI long before AI existed. So this was around 1950 when um, Alan Turing invented or let's say suggested this Turing test. At that time of course there were no such computer terminals. But you know uh, Alan Turing um, he developed the theory of computing long before there was the first computer. This was in the 1930s. Around 1944 the first programmable computer was developed. But Turing developed the theory long before. Also, he developed the, 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 the so-called Turing test long before there was AI. And now, uh, the idea is the following. So, 
there are, there are these two walls here which you have to imagine being bigger. So these persons can see over the wall. There are different rooms, okay? And there is this one person, this woman here, see, she sits on a computer terminal and she can communicate with some other agent on the other side. And she does not know whether on the other side there is another terminal with a human or there is a computer. You can see here this is uh, IBM. Um, so she doesn't know whether on the other side there is a human or a computer. But she has to find it out. And she can type in text in her terminal and this text will appear on the screen of the human or in this computer. And then the other agent of course can answer and depending on the answers she has to decide is this a human or is it a computer. Huh? Um, and uh, so Turing defined the t uh, passing the test such that if the computer can mislead Alice in 30% of the cases, then it already passes the test. And I, I don't remember, I think he even gave a, a time limit like 5 or 10 minutes. Huh? So if within 5 minutes, if there is the computer, with a probability of 30%, um, it can fake Alice, then it passed the Turing test. Oh, that's quite interesting and, and also it goes into the direction of the definition of Elaine Rich. So he doesn't talk about what's inside. He just uh, talks about what happens. So is she able from the text appearing here to distinguish between computer and human? Huh? Um, yes, so yeah. And um, so, much later, I don't remember when it was, I guess it was in the 70s, in the 1970s, Josef Weizenbaum, who at that time was a computer scientist and AI researcher, he programmed, so he wrote a program called ELISA, um, which actually uh, simulated such an AI bot. Huh? And uh, I don't remember, I don't actually know whether it passed the formal uh, Turing test. Um, but I know there are stories about Weizenbaum's secretary using this program and she was, uh, I guess she was a pretty lonesome person. Uh, maybe she was bored in the office because she didn't have much work and so she started talking to, the, to this uh, ELISA program and uh, uh, there is the saying that Weizenbaum uh, sometimes um, found her really for a long time talking to this program because she needed somebody to talk to and uh, nowadays there are these uh, these bots on in the internet so there is for example a bot called Cleverbot, Simon Levin, Alice Bot and many others huh? and they of course are a little bit more intelligent uh, than Eliza was and you can test them it's, it's uh, quite a nice game uh, testing them and so if you are, uh, your questions are not sophisticated enough um, the, the bot may cheat you and, and you won't discover that it's a bot but uh, pretty soon uh, you will see it's a bot. Okay, yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the history of AI. I, I gave you some figures about the history of AI already. 
I mean, there are people starting the history of AI in the old Egypt or I don't know. But I think uh, an interesting date is 1931, when, the, the, when Kurt Gödel, an Austrian logician, um, shows that in first order predicate logic, all true statements are derivable. Huh? That means if there is a proposition which is true, then this first order logic formal calculus is able to prove this is true. Huh? So all true statements can be proven. Huh? And this is, I mean, at that time, uh, this was a real surprise for the whole community. Huh? Um, it was a question that was stated in the year 1900 at the World Fair in Paris. There was David Hilbert, a famous mathematician. He, he made up the so-called Hilbert program, which consisted of around 20 questions. And one of the most fundamental question, questions was the question that Gödel answered in 1931. And he gave a positive answer. That's very important. So uh, Gödel showed that mathematics is able to prove all true propositions or to prove all the theorems in first order logic. And this, uh, the consequence was even more interesting for computer science because he proved there is a formal system and such a formal system can be programmed on every Turing machine. That means on every computer with every pro uh, programming language you can program a, t a theorem prover that is able to prove all true theorems of first order logic. This was really fundamental and uh, I mean this really pushed computer science and uh, of course AI forward. Huh? Look at this date. It was long before AI was invented uh, but I mean many logicians at that time this was the starting time uh, when all logicians believed we can solve all problems on this planet with logic. We just need a powerful computer and a theorem proving program. But Gödel proved that you can write this program. Okay, but a few years after this positive result came the negative result. And he proved that in higher order logics this is no longer possible. Um, he proved that as soon as your logic is just a little bit more powerful than first order logic, then it all crashes. That means there are theorems, true propositions, which cannot be proven. Huh? And that's very interesting for computer scientists. Because in computer science, we deal with languages all the time, with programming languages. Huh? And what Gödel proved is, as long as your language is simple enough, everything is fine. If your language is as simple as first order logic, everything is perfect. You can prove all true theorems. But as soon as the language is a little bit more powerful, it all crashes. And uh, the really bad news behind this second uh, Gödel's theorem is that in AI we need higher order logic. With first order predicate logic we cannot formulate all interesting things. I mean look at what is first order logic. I mean it's all about true and false. 
But we cannot talk about uncertainty. Huh? First order logic is not powerful enough to talk about incompleteness, uncertainty, and we will, we will also see um, first order logic is uh, a monotonic logic, and this is pretty bad for everyday reasoning. Um, so nowadays we know that this second result really shows us the limits at least of logic-based AI. But anyway, logicians, they were extremely optimistic until, I would say, the end of the 80s. Until about 1990, most logicians were extremely optimistic and they believed that with logic we can solve all problems on this world. We just need a powerful computer, and that's it. Uh -huh. But that was extremely naive, extremely naive, because already in the 1930s, everybody knew that logic cannot solve all problems. And, of course, there came Alan Turing, who also proved the limits of computation. Uh -huh. He proved the halting problem, which gives uh, strong limitations for intelligence. Yeah. This was in 1937. Then in 1943, McCulloch and Pitts, they gave the first mathematical model of neurons in the brain. So now you would say, oh, before you said, uh, we don't know the details of how our brain works. Um, it's true, we know some details. I mean, this is like if you want to understand a, um, a microprocessor of such a computer. I mean, everybody knows how a transistor works. Huh? But does it help your understanding the microprocessor with billions of transistors if you know how one transistor works? No. Of course, you need, you need to know the plan, you need to know the wiring, and that's what we don't know. But we do know how one single neuron works. Uh, but that doesn't help us solving the problem. But anyway, in 1943, they modeled uh, single neurons, and uh, then a neural network is just a network of these neurons. Um, so this was the start of, the, of neuroscience in computer science, but unfortunately at that time there were no computers. And therefore um, this development didn't really go forward until we had powerful computers. So we have to wait for some time. Then in 1950 there was the Turing test. 1951 Marvin Minsky developed a neural network machine with 3,000 vacuum tubes, he simulates 40 neurons. Uh, and, I mean, if you have a computer with 3,000 vacuum tubes, this is not big fun. Because these uh, vacuum tubes, they are not really reliable. They fail pretty often. So if you have such a computer, maybe it runs for one hour and then a tube fails and you have to replace it and so on. And it's not, uh, it's not very fast either, this computer. So, and 40 neurons, uh, this is not, not really much. But it was an important step to, uh, forward. Um, but still, uh, this, uh, this area of neural networks, it didn't really start. Then in 1955, Arthur Samuel, a researcher from IBM, he built a learning chess program. Uh, sorry. Why do we say... This is a, a typing error, I'm sorry. It, is not, it was not a chess program, it was a checkers program. You know, checkers in German is Dame. It's Dame Spiel. Huh? Which is uh, much simpler than chess. 
But anyway, this was a real milestone in machine learning. Um, this was the first computer program that learned to play a game. Huh? And at the end, it played better than its developer. And then in 1956, the, the term artificial intelligence was introduced. I already said this. Um, then uh, in the same year, Newell and Simon present the, the logic theories, which was the first computer program that deals with symbolic logic. So you could say the first extremely simple theorem proving program. Um, then in 1958, um, McCarthy at the MIT invents the programming lam language LISP. Uh, LISP stands for List Programming Language, um, which was, uh, is, I mean, still exists. Um, this is a, a, a high-level language involving high-level uh, data structures, lists. So you don't need to use pointers. You can work with lists. And you can work with symbols. And that's, of course, the precondition for implementing uh, logic reasoning. Yeah? So this was a, a, also a big milestone in AI. Um, and he wrote programs that were capable of modifying themselves because it was not a compiled language, it was an interpreted language. So during runtime, the program is able to modify itself. So the program can add new statements to the source code, it can remove statements from the source code, it can modify the source code, and this, of course, is a fascinating idea. Huh? So uh, this started the AI branch called genetic programming, genetic algorithms. Huh? Because genetic algorithms are like the DNA in a human body. The DNA is able to uh, reproduce itself and there is mutation. So the DNA changes and then the, uh, the agents that evolve from this DNA uh, they are different, they evolve, and so on. Um, yeah, so this was the start of genetic programming. But uh, to, uh, yeah, to tell you the truth, genetic programming was not successful at all up to now. Huh? Because the complexity of this self-modification of a program it's extremely high. And we humans do not understand how a program can modify itself. Of course a program can modify itself, but uh, with extremely high probability it won't work anymore. Huh? As soon as, you, as it uh, randomly modifies a line of code. And how to do such intelligent modifications of programs, we don't know how that works. What we do in machine learning is an extreme simplification of this. We just modify a couple of numeric parameters. All the source code doesn't change. We just modify a few parameters and that's it. And that's what we understand very well. But this real challenge of self-modifying programs, it never has been solved. Um, yeah, then there was this first theorem prover, the geometry theorem prover by Galanta, who could prove uh, theorems uh, from uh, mathematical geometry. Then there was this general problem solver, GPS, by Newell and Simon. Um, of course, it was not general. Um, then in 63, McCarthy founded the AI lab at Stanford University. And I mean, we, we still can say uh, today still the AI lab in Stanford is at least one of the, the best AI labs uh, in the world. Maybe it is the best or the biggest or the lab with the most money. Uh, so they, they uh, 
they ha at least they have a lot of money, so they can hire the best AI researchers, um, and they do excellent research. Um, in 65, Robinson invented the resolution calculus, a calculus for first order predicate logic. And this made the, uh, the automation of logic really uh, taking off. Yeah? So based on this resolution calculus, many theorem proofers uh, have been uh, built and programmed uh, pretty successfully. Then there was this ELISA program we already mentioned by Weizenbaum. Oh, and uh, of course I, I shouldn't forget to mention that Josef Weizenbaum, who meanwhile he died, I guess, two years ago. Uh, um, he was an AI researcher, but pretty soon he um, he changed into a computer critic. Yeah? Um, we should maybe we should say a society critic, and he criticized, um, for example, how AI was misused in military, for example, and so on. Um, then there came this book called Perceptrons from Minsky and Papert in 1969, which was about simple neural networks and their mathematical theory. Um, then came the European analogon to the programming language Lisp, which is Prolog. Prolog is a logic language, and actually Prolog is much closer to logic than Lisp is. Um, and therefore, for implementing a theorem prover or for doing any logic reasoning, Prolog is a very nice language. Yeah? I will cover Prolog uh, in the uh, theoretical computer science lecture when we talk about logic and we also do Prolog uh, exercises. Um, yeah, in the same year, there was the first successful expert system developed by a British physician called De Dombal. He developed an expert system for the diagnosis of acute abdominal pain. So the physician just has to get something like 10 to 20 relevant symptoms of the patient, like where is the pain in the abdomen, uh, does the patient have fever, how is the white blood cell count, and so on. And then input these symptoms into the computer and immediately get a good diagnosis of what, the pa what disease the patient has. Um, this was a real breakthrough for AI. But unfortunately, the whole AI community which was located uh, mainly in the United States at that time, and the Dombal was from Great Britain, they didn't mention what the Dombal did. So nobody knew it. A few years later, these two guys from the United States developed mycin, an expert system for diagnosis of uh, infectious diseases, uh, which got famous immediately, and in every AI book you can read about mycin, but nobody knows about uh, the Dombal's expert system, which was, first of all, it was much earlier, and second, it was much better. Um, but that's what happens from time to time in science. Huh? Uh, I mean, marketing your scientific results is yeah, today, I would say, more important than uh, having really good results. But it's not only in science. Um, in the 1980s, Japan put a lot of money into AI research. Um, it was called the Fifth Generation Project, and their goal was building a powerful Prolog machine. Because at that time, the whole AI and computer science community belie believed it is just a matter of having good computer hardware. So we need to have this powerful parallel computer and we will solve all the problems in AI. 
I mean, I never believed that that will be successful. Even, I mean, I got into AI in 1986. Um, and I got into one of these projects, not funded by Japan, but uh, by Germany. I got in, into such a, a parallel AI research project. I earned my money from this project, so um, more or less I had to speak their language. But I knew and I told these guys in the project, you will never be successful with parallel computers in AI because the complexity of the problems that we have to solve is exponential or even worse. So a linear, a constant factor, suppose we have 1,000 computers, they make the solution of the problems, of course, ideally, in the ideal case, by a factor of 1,000 uh, faster. But what is a factor of 1,000 if we would need a factor of 10 to the power 30? It doesn't help you at all because you're still left with a factor of 10 to the power 27 that your computer cannot deal with. Yeah? But that's the type of problems we have in AI. Extremely high computational complexity and hardware does not help solving these problems. There are so many examples um, where people can show if my algorithm is a little bit better that gives me much more than 1,000 parallel computers. Yeah? For example, in, in uh, chess computers, there was this computer, Hydra, developed maybe 10, 15 years ago with extreme hardware effort. And at that time, it was the best chess computer. A few years later, um, Deep Fritz was developed, which uh, uh, ran on, on a little smartphone and was better than Hydra with 1,000 or no, m even more than 1,000 parallel processes. Huh? So intelligence is not about hardware. It's about software. It's about better algorithms, better principles and so on. Um, yeah. Yeah, this was in 82, uh, uh, the DEC company, Digital Equipment, they built an expert system for configuring computers, which worked very well. Um, and so they say it saved them a lot of money um, because the machine could do the job that humans did before. Okay, and then in the mid of the 80s, there was the renaissance of neural networks. You see that that was actually 1986. That was the year when, when I graduated. Uh, I studied physics and mathematics. And um, I guess it was in 1986. There, we had our uh, physics seminar at the University of Konstanz, and they had an invited speaker um, he came from uh, Sweden, his name was Hertz. He was a neuroscientist, uh, uh, actually a, phys uh, a physicist who uh, did research in neural networks and he presented a talk with the Hopfield networks. You will learn about these two. And he, this talk was fascinating for me. And that's actually the reason why I'm here now. Uh, um, he showed that there is a little computer program that is able to learn how to recognize written characters. He presented the algorithm. And then after the talk, I immediately went to our HP workstation we had at that time and uh, programmed the algorithm. And it worked. It didn't work perfect, but it worked. So, and, and this was, for me, this was completely new. I had no idea that a computer program could learn its behavior. That fascinated me uh, that much, such that I decided not to continue with physics. I went to Munich to the Technical University and just walked through the, the corridors 
knocking at all the doors of the professors and asking them if I could do my PhD there. Right? Uh, I mean, most of them were pretty arrogant. They said, what, you as a physicist want to do computer science? You, you, you didn't study that. But finally, there was this one professor who said, oh, that sounds good. Uh, just join my group, and that's why I'm here today. Um, OK, uh, enough about my personal story. Let's go on with, uh, yeah, 1990, Pearl, Cheeseman, Whittaker, Spiegelhalter. These are famous names in the area of Bayesian networks. Um, Bayesian networks is the probability theory branch of AI. So they try to solve everyday reasoning problems with probability theory. Huh? And this branch is very successful until now. This is a really a mainstream of AI, of machine learning, uh, in robotics too. Uh, so the probabilistic uh, mathematics that's what we use today. Uh, Multi-agent systems became popular. Then in 1992, the TD Gammon program from Tesoros um, was a program that used a neural network and reinforcement learning um, to play back Gammon. And it was excellent. Um, yeah. Then in 1993, the RoboCup initiative started, um, and it still uh, is ongoing every year. There is the World Championship. Um, and the goal is, in the year 2050, to have a team of humanoid robots that uh, beat the human world champion team. So that's their dedicated goal in the year, year 2050 uh, to beat the world champion. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I almost believe that the robots, in, I mean, it's almost 40 years from now, and look 40 years back what we had in computer science and what we do have now. So if the development continues like that, then in the year 2050, uh, there will be no chance for the human team. That's what I believe, but yeah, we will see. Then statistical learning theory developed, a theory of machine learning, support vector machines. First uh, RoboCup competition in 97. Um, in 2003, that was the first RoboCup event that I attended. It was in Padua in Italy. Um, and it was really impressive how fast these robots were moving around and how they could control the ball and so on. Uh, now, in the last few years, I would say in 2006, service robotics became a major AI research area. Um, and meanwhile, since of, in the last few years, we have autonomous robots that can learn their behavior. OK, so that's the AI history up to now. Oh, and we have to stop. Oh. OK, so um, yeah, um, let me mention that uh, if somebody wants to buy such a book, you can have it uh, with a discount from me. It's more than 20% cheaper than you get it from Amazon or wherever. Okay, thank you.